It is lockdown 2.0. Feel free to judge. Frankly, I'm not even wearing pants, so. Whatever. Hello again, folks, and thank you for joining me for another classic uh, creepy story. If you have been enjoying my videos, please do uh, like, subscribe, comment below if there's a particular story you would like me to read. I am more than, pardon me, it's not related to the wine, I just have hiccups. It's, uh, I am more than open to uh, doing requests if anybody has one. So, uh, thank you for being here with me today. What we have going on today is a ghost story, the first in my December Creepy Christmas series. Today we will be exploring a work by a gentleman named E.F. Benson called... it is called... Between the Lights. I knew the lights were in the title somewhere. I do apologize, by the way, if I'm a bit scattered at the intro here. It took me a long time to try and get the green screen and everything all set up. And I can see that I actually still have some snow around me. I am new to all of this, so I apologize for the amateurness of my setup. Yeah, there's definitely some snow going on, I can see. Just, just pretend that I am a fellow creature of the ethereal plane and I'm sort of phasing in and out of existence as I'm telling you this story. And let's be honest, the, the, the visuals of what is going on here is really not that important. It's, it's my voice that is speaking the story that is a, a little more important. So yes, E.F. Benson, our first author in our Creepy Christmas, my single-handed attempt to try and revive the tradition of the, the Victorian uh, ghost stories at Christmas time sort of deal. So Benson is another English author, in case you couldn't tell by the fact that his name is Edward Frederick Benson, uh, 1867 to 1940. A very prolific writer, apparently quite a good athlete in his time. He once represented England in figure skating, which is really cool. I have never represented my country in literally anything, so that's impressive. Uh, Mr. Benson was also gay, and we, we do know that. Um, he was very discreet, as, as one would have had to have been at, uh, at the time, unfortunately. But he is the first author that I'm presenting to you that, that I can definitively tell you was, uh, was gay. There's apparently a lot of homoeroticism and sort of homosexual undertones, I guess you could say, in a lot of his works. I don't think that's so much present in, in this one in particular, but if he, as I said, very prolific writer, so there's tons of his stuff out there, if that's uh, something you'd like to go exploring for, because of course, queer coding in um, sort of vintage and antique works of art, be it, um, you know, physical meat like paintings and stuff, or literature, is of course an entire vast and really, really cool area of uh, study, uh, sort of LGBTQ plus uh, themes being present in works that were completed, you know, b before you could be open and proud about loving who you love and living the way that you, you want to live, which is, um, it's a real shame that um, someone like Benson, of course, was not free to outwardly be who he was in his time. But luckily, he is gone but not forgotten, and we are still left with uh, his, his wonderful stories to, uh, to enjoy here in 2020 with all of the other problems we're having. I promise I'm not exclusively going to chug wine from the bottle during, uh, during this video. So without too much more preamble from me, I'm just going to give my usual warning. This is early 19th, turn of the 20th century literature. Um, there might be some things in there, race, religion, orientation, all that kind of thing that may be distasteful to modern ears. In addition to the fact that sort of ghost stories, the horror genre 
generally will contain, um, you know, sometimes themes and issues that people might find disagreeable. Moving forward, my intention is um, I will mention it if I feel like there is something in particular that could be unpleasant for one of you lovely watchers. But in general, just assume that anything might have like murder, suicide, you know, the stuff that makes ghosts and, and makes horror. But if I do ever present something to you that I feel in particular deals with an, an unpleasant uh, theme, I will, I will mention it. But just keep in mind, these are horror stories. And of course, sometimes the real horror is what people do to each other. Here we go. Between the Lights by E.F. Benson, the first installment of my Creepy Christmas series. Creepy Holidays, whichever. Creepy Winter. We'll go with that, sure. I know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm doing. Between the Lights. The day had been one of unceasing fall of snow from sunrise until the gradual withdrawal of the vague white light outside indicated that the sun had set again. But as usual, at this hospitable and delightful house of Everard Chandler, <laughs> Chandler, where I often spent Christmas and was spending it now, there had been no lack of entertainment, and the hours had passed with a rapidity that had surprised us. A short billiard tournament had filled up the time between breakfast and lunch, with badminton and the morning papers for those who were temporarily not engaged. This is how you know it's British. You could not be playing badminton, even in southern Ontario, where I live, usually around the holidays, without like slush and snow and breaking an ankle, probably. While well, the afterwards, well afterwards, the interval till tea time had been occupied by the majority of the party in a huge game of hide and seek all over the house, barring the billiard room, which was sanctuary for any who desired peace. But few had done that. The enchantment of Christmas, I must suppose, had, like some spell, made children of us again, and it was with palsied terror and trembling misgivings that we had tiptoed up and down the dim passages, from any corner of which some wild screaming form might dart out on us. Then, wearied with exercise and emotion, we had assembled again for tea in the hall, a room of shadows and panels on which the light from the wide open fireplace, where there burned a divine mixture of peat and logs, flickered and grew bright again on the walls. Then, as was proper, ghost stories, for the narration of which the, the electric light was put out so that the listeners might conjure anything they pleased to be lurking in the corners, and to be lurking in the corners, succeeded and we vied with each other in blood, bones, skeleton, armor, and shrieks. That sounds like a pretty good time in a creepy old hall where you turn out the electric lights. I still kind of think that that's how you should do horror in the dark. I had just given my contribution and was reflecting with some complacency that probably the worst was now known when Everard, who had not yet administered to the horror of his guests, spoke. He was sitting opposite me in the full blaze of the fire, looking after the illness he had gone through during the autumn, still rather pale and delicate. All the same, he had been among the boldest and best in the exploration of dark places that afternoon, and the look on his face now rather startled me. No, I don't mind that sort of thing, he said. The paraphernalia of ghosts has become somewhat rather hackneyed, and when I hear of screams and skeletons, I feel I am on familiar ground and can at least hide under the bedclothes. Ah! But the bedclothes were twitched away by the skeleton, said I, in self-defense. I know, but I don't even mind that. Why, there, were, there are seven, eight skeletons in this room now, covered with blood and skin and other horrors. No, the nightmares of one's childhood were the, were the really frightening things because they were vague. I'm kind of with him on this. There was the true atmosphere of horror about them because one didn't know what one feared. Now, if one could recapture that. Mrs. Chandler got quickly out of her seat. Oh, Everard, she said, surely you don't wish to recapture it again. I should have thought once was enough. This was enchanting. A chorus of invitation asked him to proceed. The real true ghost story firsthand, which was what seemed to be indicated, was too precious a thing to lose. Everard laughed. 
No, dear, I don't want to recapture it again at all, he said to his wife, then to us. But really, the, well, the nightmare, perhaps, to which I was referring, is of the vaguest and most unsatisfactory kind. It has no apparatus about it at all. You will probably all say that it was nothing, and wonder why I was frightened. But I was. It frightened me out of my wits. And I only just saw something, without being able to swear what it was, and heard something which may have been a falling stone. Anyhow, tell us about the falling stone, said I. Yeah, you, you can't just say that and be like, no, I don't want to tell it. You just want to be goaded into telling it. There was a stir of movement about the circle round the fire, and the movement was not of purely physical order. It was as if, this is only what I personally felt, it was as if the childish gaiety of the hours we had passed that day was suddenly withdrawn. We had jested on certain subjects, we had played hide-and-seek with all the power of earnestness that was in us, but now, so it seemed to me, there was going to be real hide-and-seek, real terrors we were going to Real terrors were going to lurk in dark corners, or if not real terrors, terrors so convincing as to assume the garb of reality, were going to pounce on us. And Mrs. Chandler's exclamations as she sat down again, Oh, Everard, won't it excite you? tended in any case to excite us. The room still remained in dubious darkness, except for the sudden lights disclosed on the walls by the leaping flames on the hearth and there was wide field for, con for conjecture as to what might lurk in the dim corners. Everard, moreover, who had been sitting in bright light before, was banished by the extinction of some flaming log into the shadows. The voice alone spoke to us as he sat back in his low chair, a voice rather slow but very distinct. Last year, he said, on the 24th of December, we were down here as usual, Amy and I, for Christmas. Several of you who are here now were here then, three or four of you at least. I was one of those, but like the others, kept silent, for the identification, so it seemed to me, was not asked for. And he went on again without a pause. Those of you who were here then, he said, and are here now, will remember how very warm it was that year. You will remember, too, that we played croquet that day on the lawn. It was perhaps a little cold for croquet, and we played it rather in order to be able to say, with sound evidence to back the statement, that we had done so. Then he turned and addressed the whole little circle. We played ties of half games, he said, just as we, just as we have played billiards today, and it was certainly as warm on the lawn then as it was in the billiard room this morning direct, directly after breakfast. While well, today I should not wonder if there was three feet of snow outside, more, probably. Listen. A sudden draft fluted in the chimney, and the fire flared up as the current of air caught it. The wind also drove the snow against the windows, and as he said, listen, we heard a soft scurry of the falling flakes against the panes, like the soft tread of many little people, who stepped lightly, but with the persistence of multitudes who were flocking to some rendezvous. Hundreds of little feet seemed to be gathering outside. Only the glass kept them out. And of the eight skeletons present, four or five, anyhow, turned and looked at the windows. These were small paned with leaden bars. On the leaden bars, little heaps of snow had accumulated, but there was nothing else to be seen. Yes, last Christmas Eve was very warm and sunny, went on Everard. We had had no frost that autumn, and a Pardon me. And a terrarious dahlia was still in flower. I have always thought it must have been mad. He paused a moment. And I wonder if I were not mad too, he added. No one interrupted him. There was something arresting, I must suppose, in what he was saying. It chimed in anyhow with the hide and seek, with the suggestions of the lonely snow. Mrs. Chandler had sat down again but I heard her stir in her chair. But never was there a gay party so reduced as we had been in the last five minutes. Instead of laughing at ourselves for playing silly games, we were all taking it seriously. We're all taking a serious game seriously, pardon me. 
Anyhow, I was sitting out, he said to me, while you and my wife played your half game of croquet. Then it struck me that it was not so warm as I had supposed, because quite suddenly I shivered, and shivering I looked up. But I did not see you and her playing croquet at all. I saw something which had no relation to you or her, at least I hope not. Now the angler lands his fish, the stalker kills his stag, and the speaker holds his audience. And as the fish is gaffed and as the stag is shot, so, we, so were we held. There was no getting away till he had finished with us. You all know the croquet lawn, he said, and how it is bounded all round by a flower border with a brick wall behind, through which, you will remember, there was only one gate. Well, I looked up and saw that the lawn, I could see for one moment that it was still a lawn, was shrinking, and the walls closing in upon it. As they closed in too, they grew higher, and simultaneously the light began to fade and be sucked from the sky, till it grew quite dark overhead, and only a glimmer of light came through the gate. There was, as I told you, a dahlia in flower that day, and, this, and as this dreadful darkness and bewilderness came over me, I remember that my eyes sought, sought it in a kind of despair, holding on, as it were, to any familiar object, but it was no longer a dahlia, and for the red of its petals, I saw only the red of some feeble firelight, and at that moment the hallucination was complete. I was no longer sitting on the lawn watching croquet, but I was in a low-roofed room, something like a cattle shed, but round. Close above my head, though I was sitting down, ran rafters from wall to wall. It was nearly dark, but a little light came in from the door opposite to me, which seemed to lead into a passage that communicated with the exterior of the place. Little, however, of the wholesome air came into this dreadful den. The atmosphere was oppressive and foul beyond all telling. It was as if years, pardon me, it was as if for years it had been the place of human menagerie, and for those years had been uncleaned and unsweetened by the winds of heaven. Yet that oppressiveness was nothing to the awful horror of the place from the view of the spirit. Some dreadful atmosphere of crime and abomination dwelt heavy in it, in its denizens, whoever they were, were scarce human, so that it seemed to me, pardon me, I'm going to try that sentence again, some dreadful atmosphere of crime and abomination dwelt heavy in it. Its denizens, whoever they were, were scarce human, so it seemed to me, and though men and women were akin more to the breasts of the beasts of the field, and in addition there was present to me some sense of the weight of years. I had been taken and thrust down into some epoch of dim antiquity. He paused a moment, and the fire on the hearth leaped up for a second and then died down again. But in that gleam I saw that all the faces were turned towards Everard, and all those wore some look of dreadful expectancy. Certainly I felt it myself, and waited in a sort of shrinking horror for what was coming. As I told you, he continued, where there had been that unseasonable dahlia, there now burned a dim firelight and my eyes were drawn there. Shapes were gathered round it. What they were, I could not at first see. Then perhaps my eyes got more accustomed to the dark, or the fire burned brighter, for I perceived that they were of human form, but very small. For when one rose, with a horrible chattering to his feet, his head was still some inches off the low roof. He was dressed in a sort of shirt that came to his knees, but his arms were bare and covered with hair. Then the gesticulations and chattering increased, and I knew that, had, that they had been talking about me, for they kept pointing in my direction. At that moment my horror suddenly deepened, for I became aware that I was powerless and could not move hand or foot. A helpless, nightmare impotence had possessed of me. I could not lift a finger or turn my head, and the paralysis of the fear I... And it, Pardon me, and in the paralysis of that fear I tried to scream, but not a sound could I utter. All this, I suppose, took place with the instantaneousness of a dream, for at once, without transition, the whole thing vanished, and I was back on the lawn again, 
while the stroke of, for which my wife was aiming was still unplayed, unplayed, but my face was dripping with perspiration and I was trembling all over. Now you may all say I had fallen asleep and had a sudden nightmare. That may be so, but I was conscious of no sense of sleepiness before, and I was conscious of none afterwards. It was as if someone had held a book before me, whisked the pages open for a second, and closed them again. Somebody, I don't know who, got up from his chair with a sudden movement that made me start and turned on the electric light. I do not mind confessing that I was rather glad of this. Everard laughed. Really, I feel like Hamlet in the play scene, he said, and as if there, and as if there was a guilty uncle, uncle present, shall I go on? I don't think anyone replied, and he went on. Well, let us say for the moment that it was not a dream exactly, but a hallucination. Whichever it was, in any case, it haunted me for months. I think it was never quite out of my mind, but lingered somewhere in the dusk of consciousness, sometimes sleeping quietly, so to speak, but sometimes stirring in its sleep. It was no good my telling myself that I was, that I was disquieting myself in vain, for it was as if something had actually entered into my very soul, and as if some seed of horror had been planted there. And as the weeks went on, the seed began to sprout, so that I could no longer even tell for myself that the vision had been a moment's disordered only. I can't say that it actually affected my health. I did not, as far as I know, sleep or eat insufficiently, but morning after morning I used to wake, not gradually and through pleasant dozings into full consciousness, but with absolute suddenness, and find myself plunged in an abyss of despair. Often, too, eating or drinking, I used to pause and wonder if it was worthwhile. Eventually, I told two people about my trouble, hoping that perhaps the mere communication would help matters, hoping so, but very distantly, that though I could not believe a present at present that digest there, pardon me, but very distantly, that though I could not believe at present that digestion or the obscurities of the nervous system were at fault, a doctor, by some simple dose, might convince me of it. In other words, I told my wife, who laughed at me, and my doctor, who also laughed, and assured me that my health was quite unnecessarily robust. Can health be unnecessarily robust? Is that a thing? At the same time, he suggested that change of air and scene does wonders for the delusions that exist merely in the imagination. He also told me, in answer to a direct question, that he would stake his reputation on the, on the certainty that I was not going mad. Well, we went up to London as usual for the season, and though nothing whatever occurred to remind me in any way of that single moment on Christmas Eve, the reminding was seen to all right. The moment itself took care of that, for instead of fading, as is the way of sleeping or waking dreams, it grew every day more vivid and ate, so to speak, like some corrosive acid into my mind, etching itself there. And to London succeeded Scotland. I took last year for the first time a small forest up in Sutherland called Glen Oaks. He means ranting it. He didn't like steal a forest. That would be weird. Very remote and wild, but affording excellent stalking, hunting, not stalking people. That would be weird and inappropriate, even for the 19th century was not far from the sea, and the gillies used to always warn me to try and carry a compass on the hill, because sea mists were liable to come up with frightful rapidity, and there was always a danger of being caught by one, and of having perhaps to wait hours till it cleared again. This at first I always used to do, but as everyone knows, any precaution that one takes, which continues to be unjustified, gets gradually relaxed. Seeing into the future there a little bit. Benson, and at the end of a few weeks, since the weather had been ununiformly clear, it was natural that, as often as not, my compass remained at home. One day the stock took me his guide, he means his guide. One day the, the stock took me, pardon me, Ooh. one day the stock took me on to a part of my ground that I had seldom been on before a very high table land on the limits of my forest, which went down very steeply on one side to a loch that lay below it. 
and on the other by gentler graduations to the river that came from the loch six miles below which stood the lodge. The wind had necessitated our climbing up, or so my stalker had insisted, not by the easier way, but by the crags from the loch. I had argued the point with him, for it seemed to me that it was impossible that the deer could get our scent if we went by the more natural path. But he still held to his opinion, and therefore, since after all this was his part, this was his part of the job, I yielded. A dreadful climb we had of it, over big boulders with deep holes in between, masked by clumps of heather, so that a wary eye and a prodding stick were necessary for each step if one wished to avoid broken bones. Adders also literally swarmed in the heather. We must have seen a dozen at least on our way up, and as adders are a beast for which I have no manner of use. I guess he doesn't really like snakes. And adders are a beast for which I have no manner of use. Yep, does not like snakes. I think adders are poisonous, though, so, you know, that might be justified. But a couple of hours saw us up to the top, only to find that the stalker had been utterly at fault and that the deer must quite infallibly have got wind of us if they had remained in the place where we had last seen them. That when we could spy on the grounds again, we that when we could spy the ground again, we saw had happened, in any case, they had gone. The man insisted the wind had changed, a palpably stupid excuse, and I wondered at the moment what other reason he had, for reason I felt sure there must be, for not wishing to take what would clearly now have been a better route. But this piece of bad, of bad management did not spoil our luck, for within an hour we had spied more deer, and about two o'clock I got a shot, killing a heavy stag. Then sitting on the heather I ate lunch, and enjoyed a well-earned bask and smoke in the sun. The pony, meantime, had, had been saddled with the stag, and was plodding homewards. I agree, the guide's hiding something. The morning had been extraordinarily warm, with a little wind blowing off the sea, which lay a few miles off sparkling beneath, which lay a few miles off sparkling beneath a blue haze, and all morning, in spite of our abominable climb, I had had an extreme sense of peace, so much so that several times I had probed my mind, so to speak, to find if the horror still lingered there, but I could scarcely get any response from it. Never since Christmas had I been so free of fear, and it was with a great sense of repose, both physical and spiritual, that I lay looking up into the blue sky, watching my smoke whirls curl slowly away into nothingness. But I was not allowed to take my ease long, for Sandy came and begged that I would move. The weather had changed, he said. The wind had shifted again, and he wanted me to be off this high ground and on the path again as soon as possible, because it looked to him as if a sea mist would presently come up. And yon's a bad place to get down in the mist, he said, nodding toward the crags we had come up. I looked at the men in, in amazement, for, our to, for to our right lay a gentle slope down onto the river, and there was now no possible reason for again taking those hideous rocks up which we had climbed this morning. More than ever, I was sure he had some secret reason for not wishing to go the obvious pathway. But about one thing he was clearly right. The mist was coming up from the sea, and I felt in my pocket for the compass, and found I had forgotten to bring it. Then there followed a curious scene, which lost us time that we could really ill afford to waste. I insisting on going down by the way that common sense directed, he imploring me to take his word for it that the crags were the, same, the better way. Eventually, I marched off to the easier descent, and told him not to argue any more but follow. What annoyed me about him was that he would only give the most senseless reasons for preferring the crags. There were mossy places, he said, on the way I wished to go, a thing patently false, since the summer had been one spell of unbroken weather, or, what, or it was longer, and obviously untrue, that there were so many vipers about. I mean, there were lots of snakes where you came up, so I don't know that why snakes would all of a sudden be a problem. I agree, this is suspicious. But seeing that none of these arguments produced any effect, at last he desisted and came after me in silence. We were not yet halfway down when the mist was upon us, 
shooting up from the valley like the broken water of a wave, and in three minutes we were enveloped in a cloud of fog so thick that we could barely see a dozen yards in front of us. It was therefore another cause for self-congratulations that we were not now, as we should otherwise have been, precariously clambering on the face of those crags up which we had come with such difficulty in the morning. And as I rather prided myself on my powers of generalship in the matters of direction, I continued leading, feeling that before long we should strike the track by the river. More than all, the absolute freedom from fear elated me. Since Christmas, I had not known the instinctive joy of that. I felt like a schoolboy home from the holidays. But the mist grew thicker and thicker, and whether it was that real rain clouds had formed above it, or that it was an extraordinary density itself, I got wetter in the next hour than I have ever been before or since. The wet seemed to penetrate the skin and chill the very bones, and still there was no sign of the track for which I was making. I've had those days when it's been cold and damp and... Mm. Behind me, muttering to himself, followed the stalker, but his arguments and protestations were dumb, and it seemed as if he kept close to me, as if afraid. Now, there are many unpleasant companions in this world. I would not, for instance, care to be on the hill with a drunkard or a maniac. Fair. But worse than either, I think, is a frightened man. Because his trouble is infectious, and insensibly, I began to be afraid of being frightened, too. <sighs> Pardon me. From that, it is but a short step to fear. Other perplexities, too, beset us. At one time, we seemed to be walking on the flat ground. At another, I felt sure we were climbing again, whereas all the time we ought to have been descending, unless we had missed the way very badly indeed. Also, for the month was October, it was beginning to get dark, and it was with some sense of relief that I remembered that the full moon would rise soon after sunset. But it had grown very much colder, and soon, instead of rain, we found we were walking through a steady fall of snow. Things were pretty bad. But then, for the moment, they seemed to mend, for, far away to the left, I suddenly heard the brawling of the river. It should, it is true, have been straight in front of us, and we were perhaps a mile out of our way, but this was better than the blind wandering of the last hour and turning to the left, I walked towards it. But before I had gone a hundred yards, I heard a sudden choked cry behind me, and just saw Sandy's form flying as if in terror of pursuit into the mists. I called to him, but got no reply, and heard only the spurned stones of his running. What had frightened him, I had no idea, but certainly with his disappearance, the infection of his fear disappeared also, and I went on, I may almost say, with gaiety. On the moment, however, I saw a sudden, well-defined blackness in front of me, and before I knew what I was doing, I was half stumbling, half walking up a very steep grass slope. During the last few minutes, the wind had got up, and the driving snow was peculiar, pe pardon me, during the last few minutes, the snow had got up, and the driving snow was peculiarly uncomfortable. I mean, driving snow is usually pretty uncomfortable, especially if it's going right into your face. But there had been a certain consolation in thinking that the wind would soon disperse these mists, and I had nothing more than a moonlight walk home. But as I paused on this slope, I became aware of two things. One, that the blackness in front of me was now very close. The other, that, whatever it was, it sheltered me from the snow, so I climbed on a dozen yards into its friendly shelter, for it seemed to me to be friendly. A wall some twelve feet high crowned the slope, and exactly where I struck it there was a hole in it, or rather, through which a little light appeared, or a door, pardon me. A wall some twelve feet high crowned the slope, and exactly where I struck it there was a hole in it, or door, rather, through which a little light appeared. Wondering at this, I pushed on, bending down, for the passage was very low, and in a dozen yards came out on the other side. 
Just, at a, just as I did this, the sky suddenly grew lighter, the wind, I suppose, having dispersed the mists, and the moon, though not yet visible through the flying skirts of cloud, made sufficient illumination. I was in a circular enclosure, and above me there projected from the walls some four feet from the ground, broken stones, which must have been intended to support a floor. Then simultaneously, two things occurred. The whole of my nine months' terror came back to me, for I saw that the vision in the garden was fulfilled, and at that same moment I saw stealing towards me a little figure as if of a man, but only about three foot six in height. That my eyes told me, my ears told me that he stumbled on a stone, my nostrils told me that the air I breathed was of an overpowering foulness, and my soul told me that it was sick unto death. I think I tried to scream, but could not. I know I tried to move and could not, and it crept closer. Then I suppose the terror which held me spellbound so spurred me that I must move. For the next moment I heard a cry break from my lips and was stumbling through the passage. I made one leap of it down the grass slope and ran as I hoped never to have to run again. What direction I took I did not pause to consider so long as I put distance between me and that place. Luck, however, favored me, and before long I struck the track by the river and an hour afterwards reached the lodge. Next day I developed a chill, and as you know, pneumonia laid me on my back for six weeks. Well, that is my story, and there are many explanations. You may say that I fell asleep on the lawn and was reminded of that by finding myself, under discouraging circumstances, in an old pick's castle, where a sheep or a goat that, like myself, had taken shelter from the storm, was moving about. Yes, there are hundreds of ways in which you may explain it, but the coincidence was an odd one, and those who believe in second sight might find an instance of their hobby in it. And that is all, I asked? Yes, it was nearly too much for me. I think the dressing bell has sounded. And that is the end of our story Between the Lights by E.F. Benson. I hope you have enjoyed it. I really like this one. Um, it's creepy and sort of having this premonition. And he's right. Like he's had a premonition, a hallucination. And... You know, it's possible that nothing has even happened. You know, he's just stumbled in to some ruin, but he's been, he's gotten so worked up because of his previous vision, hallucination, and he's right. It could have been a sheep, could have been nothing, could have been the ghost of some long dead ancient human, could have been, I don't know, some sort of cryptid from uh, Scottish folklore. I don't know what that might be. That's not my area of expertise. Comment down below if you have a theory. But I really like the, the creepiness of it, of headed into this, this wall of mist and being met at the end with some sort of nefarious creature out of, uh, out of some other realm. Um, if you have enjoyed this, please like, comment, subscribe, keep an eye on my channel for other entries in my creepy holiday creepy Christmas series. Have a good day, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in your schedule. I hope you and all your loved ones are safe and well, and hopefully we are moving to a, a better new year than the year that we are leaving. So thanks for spending some time with me, folks, and I will hopefully see you again here soon for another scary story.